Now, I didn't know if you knew this secret or not, but comic book movies have had a habit of deviating from the source material, like, a lot. In some cases, it works splendidly. So splendidly, in fact, that the comics themselves actually incorporate the alterations into canon, but others have sadly remained pointless, groan-worthy divergences from established lore and style that fans have just sort of had to just put up with. For better or for worse, these iconic and distinct elements of your favourite and not-so-favourite superhero movies were inspired by the comics. I'm Ewan, you're watching What Culture, and here are 10 superhero movie staples that weren't in the comics. Number 10. Professor X is English. X-Men. So persuasive was Patrick Stewart as the ultra-powerful mutant Charles Xavier that it's easy to forget one blatant divergence he takes from the source material. Xavier is supposed to be American. Of course, Stewart sports his usually plummy English accent throughout the whole of the X-Men movies, a far cry from the character's unambiguously American origins in the comics. When Fox's film franchise eventually introduced a young Xavier in X-Men First Class, they decided to lean further into his revised nationality by having James McAvoy put on an English accent, and even featuring Xavier studying at Oxford University. The Xavier of the comics might be an American, but it's damn near impossible to read X-Men nowadays and not think of Stewart's dulcet tones emerging from the character. Number 9. The Lack of Secret Identities – The MCU the Marvel Cinematic Universe has taken a surprisingly liberal approach to adapting classic comic book characters and storylines to date, yet thanks to the generally solid quality of the franchise's writing, fans haven't generally seemed too miffed by it. One major overarching change from the source material is the radical decision to dispense with the notion of secret identities right from the off, with Tony Stark hilariously outing himself at the end of the first Iron Man. While Tony revealing his identity to the world isn't exactly anything new as far as the comics are concerned, Concerned. Since then, the overwhelming majority of the MCU superheroes have had their real identities known to the general public, which required some creativity when the Russo brothers decided to adapt the Civil War arc, which in the comics hinged around secret identities. As for who initially pitched the idea of there being no secret identities in the MCU, that was reportedly Kevin Feige, who felt that it would open up more creative possibilities for the characters, as was seen previously in the Ultimate Universe. Number 8. Organic Web Shooters Sam Raimi's Spider-Man Trilogy as great as Sam Raimi's 2002 Spider-Man movie was, and seriously, it was, it's amazing, many fans nevertheless bristled up against one major change from the comics, giving Peter Parker organic web shooters. Plus, the gnarly-looking hairs coming out of Peter's fingers when he discovers he can climb walls. Ugh. Now, traditionally, Parker has always used his own genius to create the webbing mechanically, yet presumably in an attempt to streamline his origin story and cut down on the implausibility factor of a movie already Training in it, Raimi simply made the webbing another of Spidey's powers. Number 7. The Bat Voice Batman 1989 One of the biggest qualms about any superhero with a secret identity is how nobody close to them ever realizes that they sound identical to their regular selves. Tim Burton's 1989 Batman did a great job of combating this by having Batman utter his superhero lines at a lower register, ensuring he didn't sound too much like Bruce Wayne. Moreover, the idea was floated by Michael Keaton himself, a self-confessed logic freak who felt that without a voice change, Batman's identity would be easily uncovered. Colored contact lenses were also considered to differentiate the two, yet Keaton ultimately went all in with the voice. It's a choice that subsequently affected pretty much every single live-action, animated, and video game portrayal of the Cape Crusader since, with Kevin Conroy perfecting the formula in Batman the Animated Series. Some pre-1989 comics did mention Batman having a distinctive voice, with 1980s The Untold Legend of Batman noting a soft voice, quote, as cold as the Antarctic wind, but nothing quite in line with what Keaton cooked up. Number 6. Tony Stark Creates Ultron – Avengers Age of Ultron Though Avengers Age of Ultron might feel like a world away these days, Tony Stark's creation of Ultron is unquestionably one of the MCU's most pivotal events so far. Ultron was designed as a failsafe following the events of the first Avengers movie, but after Ultron nearly annihilated the world, Tony was left severely affected, and it served as the catalyst for him signing the Sokovia Records. Despite presenting as such a major character through line for Tony Stark, this was actually changed from the comics, where Hank Pym is in fact fact, Ultron's creator. In both cases, Ultron serves as a mirror image of its maker, yet the overall implication is quite different. You can certainly argue that this change robs Hank
and Pym of a major character arc, but given that Pym wasn't an MCU fixture at the time of the film's release, it made sense to rework it for the benefit of Stark's character development instead. Number 5. The Concept of the Daywalker, Blade before Blade was adapted to the big screen back in 1998, it's fair to say that the character was a relatively niche superhero in Marvel's back pocket, and that the movie trilogy did a fantastic job elevating the character's popularity. The first film made countless changes to Blade's conception, changing his personality from gregarious to stoic and shifting his power set substantially too. Above all else though, the cinematic Blade was reconceived as a daywalker, a rare breed of vampire capable of withstanding exposure to daylight. Because Marvel Comics quickly realized how freaking cool this was, and saw the film's healthy box office receipts too, no doubt, they wasted no time at all in folding Blade's cinematic retooling into the comics. 1999's Peter Parker Spider-Man No. 8 had Blade get bitten by Morbius the Living Vampire, causing an unexpected mutation in Blade's blood, allowing him to venture out into the sunlight and leading to him being dubbed, yes, the Daywalker. It was a good change, no question. Number 4. Batman Kills People A lot. Almost every Batman movie ever. One of Batman's most distinctive attributes in the comics is his famed no-kill policy, whereby he refuses to kill any criminal to ensure a discernible line is drawn between him and the people he hunts. Sadly, the movies have consistently made a hash job of conveying Batman's no-kill policy to audiences, with every single one of the live-action Batman films having the Dark Knight kill at least one person, save, ironically, the worst one of all, Batman and Robin. In Adam West's 1966 Batman, he vaporizes a goon with a single kick, long story. He is a bloodthirsty maniac in Burton's 89 Batman and kills the Joker, slaughters the Penguin in Batman Returns, murders Two-Face in Batman Forever, burns down the League of Shadows HQ and lets Ra's al Ghul die in Batman Begins. He also kills Two-Face yet again in The Dark Knight and offs Talia al Ghul in The Dark Knight Rises. As for Batman v Superman, well, Batflex shoots up bad guys by the dozen, brands criminals which then leads to their own deaths in prison, and is an all-around murderous fascistic monster far from his traditional comic book conception. Here's hoping that, you know, Matt Reeves' take writes this wrong when it eventually does release. Number 3. The Total Absence of Mutants The MCU Until the recent completion of the Disney-Fox merger, Fox owned the exclusive on-screen rights to Marvel's X-Men characters, and by extension the use of the term mutant in relation to any Marvel figures. As a result, the MCU has been unable to include traditional comic book mutants of any kind, with the likes of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver having their origins altered so as to be experiments of Baron Wolfgang von Strucker until, you know, WandaVision then retconned that again, but I digress. And oh, even though it is also worth pointing out that those two characters' respective status as mutants has been retconned multiple times in the comics, it's all really a bit confusing. All in all though, this is still one of the MCU's biggest divergences from the comic book lore. After all, it's perfect reasonable to expect mutants to have joined the fold some 22 movies into the Enterprise. Number 2. The Goofy Leather Jumpsuits The Original X-Men Trilogy The original X-Men Trilogy undeniably broke new ground as far as superhero movies go, but Fox was also still testing quite how much silliness audiences would be prepared to put up with and played it rather coy where the X-Men's attire was concerned. An unfortunate mainstay of the first three X-Men films was the garish black leather jumpsuits which couldn't have hewed much further from the mutants' more elaborate and colourful costumes in the comics, which might be the coolest in the entire medium. Though the suits were revised across the trilogy, they never really evoked their vibrant comic book equivalent beyond some subtle coloured trim, and they haven't aged well at all either. The worst thing about all of this though, the Wolverine, which is actually quite underrated in my opinion, even teased Logan's comics accurate costume in a deleted ending, while X-Men Dark Phoenix also ditched the colourful outfits teased at the end of Apocalypse. Here's hoping the MCU gets the costumes right because the X-Men are Marvel's most stylish characters, and this cannot keep going on into the future. And number 1. Ra's al Ghul as Bruce's trainer Batman Begins Though Ra's al Ghul only has a major role in the first of Christopher Nolan's Batman movies, Batman Begins, his training of Bruce Wayne and subsequent betrayal traces a narrative trajectory that intersects throughout the entire franchise, concluding with the defeat of Talia al Ghul at the end of The Dark Knight Rises. Yet despite Nolan's mostly respectful treatment of the source material, his depiction of Ra's al Ghul is markedly different from the comics, where he was never a mentor to Bruce, nor did he hide 
inspired under the guise of Henry Ducard, who is a totally separate character in the source material. Also, you know, the whole whitewashing the character thing, which he'd do yet again with Bane in The Dark Knight Rises 2. In the comics, Ra's al Ghul is literally hundreds of years old and is able to revive himself through the use of the Lazarus Pit, all of which was elided from Nolan's grittier, more realistic treatment. Plus, given how fundamentally the Ra's Bruce dynamic defines the origins of Batman and Nolan's franchise, it's pretty staggering how significantly he changed the character from the source material. And those were 10 superhero movie staples that weren't in the comics. What elements from the source material do you think should have made it to the big screen? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to chuck us a like if you enjoyed the video and to also subscribe to One Culture so you don't miss another upload going forward. I've been Ewan, I hope you have a great day wherever you are and I will see you next time. Bye!